Hello and welcome to Arts Alive. Until November 29th, the Brindley in Runcorn displays War, Art and Surgery, an exhibition by artist Julia Midgley that looks at the training of military medical personnel and the rehabilitation of those injured during the conflict. Julia's documentary drawing technique has been used in the past in different contexts, like documenting the Everyman's Theatre Live, the Biennial, or even Mercy Fairies. Uh, a lot of those initially took place in the Northwest. So, um, for example, at Royal Liverpool and Gore Green Hospital Trust, I was there for two years, recording with drawings how medicine and how the NHS works at the end of a century, because this was 97 to 99. Um, and also, I worked at Blackpool Pleasure Beach for two years, recording how people enjoy themselves, but also behind the scenes, how a company like that works. Um, at Granada Television in their news department and the weather department, and um, showing with drawings how an instantaneous medium like television works. So whilst my drawings might take hours and days to complete, um, their work would be done in fractions of a second, you know and decisions would be made. But the key thing is it um, relies on drawing skills and I draw what I see as it takes place in front of me. And that sheet of paper that I start on, location, is the same piece of paper that gets developed back at home on the in the studio. So I don't use cameras unless I have to photograph some complicated equipment, but it's people I'm interested in, what they do and how they work. Um, and it never ceases to intrigue me how the working life of people is very different and the challenges they face. And um, that's in a way what attracted me to working with the military and their medicine and how they were trained and prepared for combat. Well, it's about the training of um, military medical personnel before their deployment to, in this case, Afghanistan. And then the rehabilitation of the wounded when they've been repatriated to the UK, they've had their reconstructive surgery and they go to Headley Court in Surrey for rehabilitation and to prepare them to go back into normal life. Um, so there were two aspects and um, a lot of the training of the military medics employs simulation techniques that are so close to reality that, um, you, you know, it's real eye-opening, particularly for a lay person like me. Um, it also, the whole project, War Art and Surgery, was a collaboration with the Royal College of Surgeons in, uh, of England in, in London. And they um, hold in their archives a suite of drawings by Henry Tonks from World War I, where he made drawings of the reconstructive surgery by a very famous surgeon called Henry uh, Harold Gillies. Uh, Henry Tonks had trained as a surgeon, but he then retrained as an artist. And so in World War I, he was the perfect person for Harold Gillis to select to record this reconstructive surgery. And this was on the faces of men who'd been damaged whilst fighting in the trenches. And um, this work took place in um, Sidcup, mainly or Aldershot. And the drawings, there's a suite of um, around about uh, 50 of them, which are astonishing drawings. We have a couple of reproductions of them here. So whilst my work in no way does the same thing um, as Henry Tonks, we're looking still at the damage done by combat a hundred years on from the First World War. So in a way, that's kind of why I wanted to do it now. And uh, fortunately, the military were happy to embrace the idea. And um, the Royal College of Surgeons very graciously allowed my work to be shown opposite the Henry Tonkses in London last year. So that was a big, big thing. as you work and the more years behind you the, the quicker you get at doing it really so you visually edit as you start the drawing 
Uh, and as you see, I mean, there's not a lot of background in any of the drawings. Uh, it's just people I'm focusing on. And the, hopefully the most dramatic or the most interesting thing to me at the time. And, and um, I work on tinted paper quite often. That means that if you then draw a white line on it, it, it has a lot more impact sometimes. And uh, it gives you an instant um, sort of tonal range that you wouldn't have if you started on white paper necessarily. So that's a big help. Um, and I, I, because I draw with a line instead of tonally, as a rule, a line is quite rapid, it's a bit like handwriting, so you can work very quickly and then that's an aid memoir, so back in the studio you can drop in some wash or some other bits of detail. You know. their job to do, and that's defence and looking after people who have been badly wounded. And I wasn't really sure how to, um, who was the right person to approach. But gradually, by talking to somebody who I knew, who was um, a dental surgeon, he introduced me to somebody who was a reconstructive dental surgeon, who then in turn introduced me to somebody in the military. So it was step by step. And um, once we'd had the meetings with the sort of getting higher up the hierarchy, then the more interested they all became. And, and there was a general will for this project to take place. Um, but of course, it's complicated because you can't just go in and draw a patient without making sure that those patients are absolutely clear what you want to do and that they consent to your being there. And um, so it's, it's nothing went wrong at all. I mean, amazingly, it was very smooth, the whole running thing, but it just takes time to prepare properly to be embedded within an organisation in a way and for them to understand that you're not going to pose any risks and that you're not going to do anything stupid and that you know, you're not going to trip up or knock some you know, equipment over, that sort of thing. And of course, to someone who's in a different discipline to the visual arts, if you say to them you're going to send an artist, so they may visualise a big easel, you know, and, Pots of paint, but I'm just—I've just got small sheets of paper and effectively a pencil or a pen. So you have to learn to be very much a fly on the wall. That's the point, and to be not intrusive—that's the key. That's the most difficult bit, actually. Really. Yeah, I was wondering. I mean, I was wondering yourself. How did you feel when you were surrounded by these guys who are like training and just—they're training to face death as well? Yeah. And I don't know. How do you? How did you feel? Um, it's very, it's very humbling, but it's very, very interesting as well. So, in a way, when you watch the exercises, the preparation for what they don't really know they're going to encounter, although some of them have already been out in, in theatre, as they call it, before. Um, I was struck by the professionalism, by the thoroughness of what they go through, by the attention to detail, and I was also struck by. Um, the, the way they have to work together very much as a team, for different disciplines it's very much teamwork, whereas you know, an artist is just, I mean, just a one-man band, so that's something you watch with great interest. Um, but also the fact that, of course, with surgeons, they, these days they tend not to um, know the whole body as a, as a, as a specialism. They, they tend to specialise in certain areas of the body. And, but for this sort of purpose, they have to have a much broader understanding. So they're learning as well, you know, and, and I'm learning watching them. And, um, it's very, very interesting. And with the patients, though, that was the bit that's more, that connects more with you as an artist, I think. So I have two sons, and they're very much the same age as these soldiers who've come back with limbs missing, you know, and so that connects very strongly. Um, and it's not something you can easily put into words, but it certainly makes its mark, you know. So what you hope is that the drawings will tell a story. Um, and I was asked once why the drawings were such lightweight things, why they didn't show all the horror of war, of war with mud and blood and everything, but I wasn't dealing with the moment of impact. I'm dealing with the preparation to heal, and I'm dealing with the actual rehabilitation which and rehabilitation is a very personal thing where you've got a drawing of a person about to take his first steps on 
prosthetic limbs, and I'm sitting there just a few feet away, and, I, and you know you can feel quite intrusive, so I was always saying, you sure you don't mind me being here? And they didn't mind at all. That's very interesting, you know. But it's very, I think it's very important that the drawings don't scare away the audience. I want people to go and look at them and learn the story and see what happens, you know. The training, perhaps in this drawing, you know, this is, this is probably one of the more active ones and more completed ones. And that, there, they're in a helicopter simulating a collection of, a wounded, uh, of the wounded off the ground during conflict. And the helicopter is simulating that sort of evasive action having taken off in a very difficult, dangerous place. And, and so this is probably the most, the closest to, to that sense of being there at the moment. And of course, you know, at the back of the helicopter, out of sight, there are military weapons. There are soldiers who go out first with their guns before the patients are brought on board. And this is an aircraft that is actually flying over Oxfordshire ducking and diving, and, um, it's, it's exciting, but at the same time, think, you know, they're trying to cure this patient here on the floor, you know, the difficult moving object, so that's probably why it's got much more in it. And I was sitting down, I wasn't having to walk around following the people, you know. After the break on Arts Alive, we'll meet artist and curator of the Blue Coat Display Centre's new exhibition, Re Reanimate, Repair, Meld and Mend. Welcome back to Art Alive. Since October 10th and up to the 14th of November, the Blue Coat Display Center presents a new exhibition, Re Reanimate, Repair, Meld and Mend, that look at the idea of recycling everyday objects into pieces of art and the concept of reuse and reanimation of the existent. I think recycling is part of modern, you know, you know, as we sort of come to terms with the sort of our overuse of the world's resources, um, recycling has become more and more popular. Uh, just in general, everywhere, we, we recycle all kinds of things now. Um, and I think artists have, uh, have often reused material, you know. There's that thing about great artists, you know, steel, isn't it, or something. Um, uh, but, but, and so, so I think it's become part of contemporary practice. And uh, it's not difficult to find artists who are actually use, reusing material that already exists. And um, because in my own work, uh, I, I basically uh, reuse ready-made ready ceramics, um, it was very natural for me to look elsewhere at other people doing the same thing. A few years ago, I did work for an exhibition um, called The Nature of Mending. And as part of that exhibition, there was, it, it, was, it was a small commission for me to do. And one of the things that, uh, that I've long been interested in is the way that old ceramics is repaired with metal staples or metal rivets, or they're wired together. Before the advent of modern glues, you know, people repaired things. They didn't just throw them away. And um, so for that, uh, for that exhibition, I, I taught myself how to wire and how to rivet ceramics. Um, and so it's become part of my practice, really. So it wasn't difficult, to, and it's not difficult to find other people doing the same, not the same, but who are re, reusing broken things or who are bringing old things back to life by changing their function or their, their look. When I selected the artists, I wasn't just looking at people who reuse plates or textiles or bits of wood. I was also looking at artists who reuse old devalued material so like you know world war one souvenirs which you can pick up on ebay for a few pounds um, or the archive at spode you know there's, there's a huge archive um, in the potteries in the ceramics industry of patterns and, in, and and material that was that was once very popular on tablewares that's now in the staffordshire county archives and that is just there you know for historians and what have you now you know many artists look at that material and they bring it back to life and to me that's the same kind of process you know whether you take a graphic a pattern from a surface and then reanimate it enlarge it collage it crumple it clone it it's the same kind of thing that you're doing digitally uh, as the person who's taking a, uh, two bits of metal 
and, and welding or soldering them together, you know, two bits of old metal and soldering them together. So I don't see there's a big difference between reusing pattern and existent old images and reusing materials, because they're all materials, they're just, some are digital and some are real. When I say reanimate, that's my, it's to bring things back to life, you know, many of the, um, many of the, the objects that I use in my, in my contemporary work are things I bought on eBay for just a few pounds, because they've been thrown away. Basically, people don't want them anymore. You know, broken plates, plates with cracks in, plates with chips in, you know, plates that are all crazed all over, and, and people don't want them. And I, and you, I buy them very cheaply. Um, but, and, and, you know, I refire them. And when you refire them, the glaze melts again, and then things happen, and all, all the stuff that had, had dissolved into the cracks, all the chip fat and the beef dripping and the gravy, it all burns away, and sometimes you get these lovely blooms in the glaze. Um, but whatever happens, it very often cleans the plate up completely. Um, and I think if you look back at other, if you look at other societies, in other societies, people value old things more than they do new things, because old things have evidence of their life in their fabric, in their material. I was very struck a few years ago when I visited New Zealand. Um, and one of the museums in New Zealand, the Aborig of, of objects from Aboriginal peoples, um, showed you know a whole series of objects that, that that were extremely valuable because they had been handed down through generation to generation. Now, in 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 our culture, I mean, I'm not saying that isn't present in our culture, but very often when things get a bit dirty or they get a bit cracked or there's a chip in something or it gets a bit tarnished we tend to put it in the cupboard or you know it goes in the bin or you get rid of it on eBay and um, I'm very interested in that material because as I say it's already got a life it's already got a story when you pick it up it's got a story in it and especially those ones that have been repaired you know somebody spent an awful lot of time drilling holes in that place or sewing if it's a textile darning a textile you know darning something and repairing it it's been a lot of love and time to reanimate to bring it back to life to make it useful again and I think that's a very valuable thing um, and as artists you know one of the things artists do is they I think they help us help to see the world in a different way and um, I hope that what we do is bring things back to life. pieces in this exhibition. Uh, one of them is a plate that's just behind me. Um, it's a plate, um, well it, it follows the format of the exhibition which is to take um, objects that have had one life and to give them another life. So it's, it's an old Portuguese plate from um, a charity shop and it's combined with uh, a small cast figure from my studio, uh, which relates to another exhibition that I have at the moment around World War I. Uh, it's a figure of a broken crucifix. Um, it's called the Christ of the Trenches, and it was used in World War I um, by Portuguese soldiers um, who took, took the crucifix into the trenches with them after it had been blown up. So I'm using it in the context of war and conflict although the context is slightly changed. So what I've printed on the plate is a phrase from a World War I song, They'll Never Believe Me, uh, but it's printed in Russian and Ukrainian. So it's actually making contact with a contemporary conflict through the sort of lens of uh, World War I. It's about a different attitude to making as well. It's, it's about finding as well as as well as making everything from scratch, sometimes using the redundant and the industrial, as well as the handcrafted. Uh, although some of the artists here are very, very handcrafted, some are much more, um, much more about finding industrial material and reusing that.
there's a very, a very um, interesting book called, um, what's it called? Cradle to Great Cradle, Remaking the Way We Make Things. And it's, um, it's a very interesting book because the authors argue that in, when, we, when we make things uh, industrially, uh, we don't think about what happens when they're finished or they, we didn't used to. And, and he, uh, they argue that when things are designed, they, we should think about their whole life and, and you should be able to re uh, recycle everything within things. And they, what they say is lots of things that we use today, well, although we think we're upcycling, we, we, we think we're recycling them, we're actually downcycling them because we recycle plastic bottles and we make them into, they make them into jackets and then you recycle the jackets and gradually each time you recycle something it gets less and less valuable and in the end it ends up in the tip anyway. And they say, they, they talk about one process which is about upcycling, that is taking humble materials and actually making them something more valuable. And to me, the artists in this exhibition are involved in that kind of process. They've taken, in many cases, very humble materials and they've upcycled them. They've elevated them to desirable objects that are very beautiful. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've had a look around the show. There's some very beautiful objects in here. But very often they're made from very humble materials. And um, so I think it's quite appropriate, and that's quite a, an appropriate role for the artist to actually take a humble material, upcycle it. And also, I, and I also I think that it's very appropriate that artists make beautiful objects. For a while, it was not fashionable for art, contemporary art to be beautiful. Personally, I think it's great when, when contemporary art is beautiful as well. So I think here you've got a mixture of materials. You've got a mixture of, the way, of ways of approaching the subject. Um, and you've got a whole series of very interesting and um, beautiful objects. That's all this week on Arts Alive. See you next time.